It's starting to break. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our headline story, we're starting to see major stress in the credit markets. We're starting to see them fracturing. And of course, what this leads to is eventually delinquencies and defaults because the amount of distressed debt we're seeing right now is absolutely skyrocketing. Now, this tends to be a normal thing that happens during the late stage expansions. So what we're seeing here isn't such a surprise that it's happening. It's the size and scope of it that is the real issue here and of course central banks are totally ignorant to what is going on here as many of you know we're not big fans of central bankers on this show because what happens during long periods of economic expansions the amount of debt starts to build up and the longer the expansion goes the quality of the debt gets worse and worse and worse but it often persists due to ongoing central bank monetary policy that's kept too loose. Now, rather than focus on an economic growth target, which is what the central bankers really should be doing, they get fixated on an inflation target. And of course, that's where the problems begin because if the economy isn't growing fast enough to service all of this debt, the next thing you know, you start to get delinquencies and defaults. And if you get too many, of them, you get an all out financial crisis. Now, some of you may remember back to the great financial crisis, we had these things called collateralized mortgage obligations, which was one of the catalysts for the whole meltdown in the banking system. And I said years ago that don't worry, this will be back, but in a different form. And sure enough, today you're going to see it's not in the housing market, but that same scheme is back. So as we talk about distressed debt today, I want you to understand what that means is it doesn't mean that the loans are in default. It doesn't mean they're delinquent. It just means the bankers, the economists, the analysts are looking at this debt and saying, hey, if things don't get better, there's a good chance that this debt is going to move into delinquency and potentially then into default. Now, there are some cases where debt gets issued in a distressed state to begin with, but most of the time, debt turns into a distressed state as the economy slows. Now, I also wanna mention we do have a sponsor for today's show. I'm gonna give you seven reasons at the end of the show why I'm gonna be adding this stock to my portfolio tomorrow and why you may wanna consider that. And many of you have asked, am I really buying all of these securities that I'm talking about on the show? The answer is yes, I am. And we're currently working with our compliance team to not only publicly disclose those, but provide an ongoing source for you to track what I'm doing and what my thoughts are. So let's get into today's story. As credit markets crack widen as distress debt nears $650 billion. Remember, the banks keep telling us this isn't a big deal. Multiple stress points are emerging in credit markets after years of excess from banks stuck with piles of buyout debt, a pension blow up in the UK, and real estate troubles in China and South Korea. With cheap money becoming a thing of the past, those may just be the start. Distressed debt in the U.S. alone jumped more than 300% in 12 months as high-yield issuance is much more challenging in Europe and leverage ratios have reached a record by some measures. Now, again, look at that number, that 300% number in 12 months. So what is that telling us is the economy is slowing now and is slowing rapidly enough that there is concern that these companies, wherever these, this debt is sitting at, it may not be able to be serviced. Again, a lot of this wasn't issued in distressed state, but now it's getting to that point where there's growing concern. And what do we hear from the Fed? We're not doing enough. We need to tighten policy even more. And what that's going to eventually lead to is a snowball effect of defaults. And that is and has been my major concern. Globally, almost $650 billion of bonds and loans are in distressed territory. It's adding up to the biggest test of the robustness of corporate credit. Now, here's where it's at. It's sitting in the corporate market since the financial crisis. And here you go, may spark the wave of defaults. And many people say there's no way central bankers will get back to zero or even perhaps find some way to go negative, as we talked about in the show the other day. And the answer is yes, they will. When you start seeing massive of amounts of defaults in the corporate space or anywhere in the debt markets, there is 
is one solution, although it isn't quick, it's go back to zero, drop rates down, and get that de debt refinanced. You'll see it happen. It happened before, and it'll happen again. Of course, banks say their wider credit models are proving robust so far, so they're in great shape. But as we know, that is not the case at all because they've begun setting aside more money for missed payments, which is not something the banks do when things are good. And there's further evidence that banks know things are bad in this chart here which is the number or the percentage of domestic banks tightening standards for commercial industrial loans. And you can see this is released quarterly that is above the black line. So anywhere you see the blue line above the black line, it means they're tightening standards. Now, if it's going rising, they're tightening at a faster pace. And if it's declining, they're tightening at a slower pace. And so what this means from the bank's perspective is they're cutting back their loan issuance. They're looking more closely at who they're lending money to because they're starting to get fixated on getting the money back they've already lent out because they're starting to realize that the probabilities of that will maybe not as good as they think. Loan loss provisions at system, system, systematically important banks are 75% in the third quarter compared with a year earlier. Again, a sign, the clear indication that they're bracing for payment issues and defaults while they're telling us there's A-OK. -okay. We know that's not the case. As most economists forecast a moderate slump over next year, a deep recession, however, could cause significant credit issues because the global financial system is vastly over leveraged. And again, this is the case for how rates get back to zero is you have this aggressive tightening from central bankers, you have the monetary lags, the economy slows down, those lags kick in, the defaults start to increase, next thing you know, they snowball, the only solution is to drop rates down. But as we've seen in the past, and again, I wanna reiterate, that doesn't solve the problem immediately, it eventually gets there, but not right away. Right now, the outlook for economic growth is a concern. Rolling recessions are likely across the globe next year with the U.S. likely to slip into one in the middle of next year. Again, this comes from Citigroup, of course, one of those major banks. Mike Scott, a portfolio manager, says markets seem to be expecting a soft landing in the U.S., and that may not happen. The leveraged low market is something that we're monitoring as well. And that market has ballooned in recent years. There was 834 million of leveraged loan issuance in the US just last year, more than double the rate in 2007 before the financial crisis. Now, if you're not familiar with what a leveraged loan is, it's when you give a loan to someone who's already got a ton of debt and is already under stress and you're not sure if they're even gonna be able to pay that back, but they need the loan anyways, maybe for operational reasons, maybe for other things, they're trying to buy some things out. But again, it's leveraged on the fact that there's hope that business turns around and they're able to pay it. So notably, you see a large expansion of this debt. That's not a good sign. And leveraged loans have seen the greatest buildup of excess or lower quality debt, which makes perfect sense. That's what it is to begin with. And it hasn't been this high since the financial crisis. And of course, they think default rates could rise to 9% next year. And in this new world of higher rates and greater risk aversion, there's a squeeze on global banks, which have been left saddled with about 40 billion of buyout debt. Of course, we talked about that in a recent show, of particularly with Twitter, where banks agree to lend money for one company or somebody to buy out another company. And these deals are done in advance and they can often take many months before that loan is actually done. If financial conditions change, credit conditions change, it's a contract they're obligated. And the problem the banks have right now is they can't offload that debt to other people. And as you know, they don't wanna be stuck with it when the music stops, they're desperate to get rid of it, but they can't. And higher borrowing costs could also have an impact on the collateralized loan obligation market. Here's that, remember before this was called the collateralized mortgage obligation market. Now we've got a new word, loan, which pulled the leveraged loans and then securitized them within tranches of varying risk. Again, exactly what they did with mortgages. And he said they are concerned about higher defaults and lower tier portions of CLOs. And these underlying loans have higher leverage ratios and weaker covenants than in the high yield market. Now, where are these loans at? You're asking if they're not in the mortgage market, where are they? 
They're in the corporate market. They're against companies. These are money. Com these are loans that co companies have issued and they're borrowed against, and they're repackaging them and selling them out to the broad market. Again, just like what the banks did with mortgages, they're doing it with their corporate borrowers. We have less concern over these defaults. Of course, we had less concern over the housing market because the safest tranches, they have over collateralization levels that are generally acceptable. Remember back during the housing market, they said the same thing. Oh, look, we have all these high rated loans up front. It would take so many of these other bad loans to go bad before anything went wrong. And well, sure enough, they did. The erosion of covenant protection also means CLO holders and other investors in leveraged loans, such as mutual funds. Again, where does all this debt end up? In the hands of investors are more vulnerable to losses than in the past. Recovery values as a result could be lower than average when defaults eventually do occur. So you get this perspective here that while the banks say everything is A-OK, -okay, we know that there was so much debt issued, just an extreme amount, that this rapid slowdown of the global economy is going to lead. Now we see to distress loans, then you know, what will we see early into next year? So we'll start to see delinquencies, and then somewhere into later next year, the defaults will start to build and increase. And if they skyrocket, if they get out of control, watch out. We're not just going to have a financial crisis, we're going to have a hard lending or hard landing. And that's been my concern and why I think we're still headed that way, even though the Fed says it's not a chance, even though the banks say we're in great shape. Of course, we know that's not always going to be the case. And now I'd like to introduce to you our sponsor for today's show, which is Avalon Global Care. Now they recently changed their ticker symbol. They are now training under ALBT under the NASDAQ. They're a biotech company. And here's the seven reasons that I'm gonna be adding them to my portfolio tomorrow. And I'll put a link to this in the description below with their symbol and their uh, corporate presentation book for you to do some more research. Now the stock has been making some big moves. It made a 97% move back in September when it traded from 38 cents intraday on on a low on November 1st and reach almost 75 cents by November 8th. So you're looking here, one potential reason is the stock makes big moves. And it's also been flying under the radar. As experts say, this is one of 2022's most overlooked biotech stocks with shares trending in the 34 to 37 cent range. So if you're looking to add biotech to your portfolio, well, you may want to add Avalon Global Care. And you might want to notice it's trading very similar to another stock we talked about recently called ClearMind. And of course, we know that it can make big moves too. We see that here with Avalon trading very similar. And what I want to look at because it's a biotech company it is traded on the nasdaq if we see a break higher in biotech stocks which i think we're going to see what you can expect is companies like avalon to go higher and again that symbol a l bt and here is the biotech etf the biggest one ibb and you can see it's formed a head and shoulders bottom for those of you who follow technical analysis there you can see that beautiful bottom and here you can see it's trading right in this range it almost broke out and now it's coming back and consolidating if the price here then heads higher and breaks up you can likely expect that companies like avalon are going higher with it and as far as another thing we like to look at number three on the list insider ownership over the past 12 months insiders and avalon have bought 10 million shares one director one's how lou bought 10 million shares back in july back and when it was trading and 78 cents so you see bought in july and bought more than almost half a million shares at 78 cents in august and he is buying more you know if an insider's buying it has a good indication that they believe they've got something for number four they believe they're cracking the cancer code and of course any news if they they could will likely send the stock higher they're working on a new research study applying artificial intelligence enhanced protein design they call qty code technology which is expected to accelerate the development of therapeutic monoclonal antibodies to treat cancer 
And they're headquartered in a hotbed and breeding ground for successful biotechs and responsible, get this, a staggering 70 new FDA drug approvals between 2020 and 2021. So they're looking to move and have a big hit. And they've got patents. Avalon alone has jointly filed 16 patent applications, co-invested with key strategic partners, including a top five U.S. university, a leading education research center in Europe, as well as a premier multinational developer of cellular therapies in the field of oncology. And they're aggressively focused on mergers and acquisitions. On November 10, Revere Securities announced it served as a merger and acquisition advisor of a 31 million transaction for Avalon Global Care Corp. when the company signed a definitive acquisition agreement to acquire a 60% interest in Laboratory Services LLC to expand its focus on lab testing and services. But adding to all that, what the real key here with Avalon is this stock has made big moves and could make another big move in the near future. Here you can see going back to their trading when they were trading under ALBT or what they were trading, they were trading under their previous symbol now merged with ALBT. What do you see here is big move 71%, 71%, 88%, 43%, 97%. Now the stock is headed lower and could make some big moves. Here you can see going back, you see these one, two, three, four, five big moves in that stock and it could happen again. And of course, we talked about that insider buying from Wenzhou Lu. He's bought a ton of this at a higher price point. Notably, he bought those 10 million shares in July at 65 cents and again came back and bought nearly half a million more shares at 78 cents back in August. So he must know something and also looking for the stock to move. Now I'll put a link to the corporate presentation in the description below, but you can see they're a clinical stage biotechnology company dedicated to develop and deliver innovative and transformative cell tech with a multifunctional conversion in cellular technologies and therapeutics. They've got a stacked board of directors. They've got a great management team, a clinical and scientific advisory board that is great. You see, they've got a bunch of the who's who in the biotech space tied to this company. But keep in mind, Avalon Global Care is now trading under ALBT. So again, as I mentioned earlier in the show, I have been purchasing all of these stocks. It doesn't mean you should, but I have been. I'm going to add Avalon to my portfolio tomorrow morning. And again, we're working with compliance. So that way you can see my purchases, my ongoing research with these companies, where perhaps I'm selling, what I'm doing, so you can follow along. So again, thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.